This is your Kick-Ass Life Podcast, episode number 110 with guest Karen Anderson. All links and resources you hear on this podcast can be found by going to yourkickasslife.com forward slash 110. This is the Your Kick-Ass Life Podcast with Andrea Owen, a no BS guide to self-help and badassery. Because ladies, let's face it, life's too short for it to not kick ass. And here's your host. The girl who serves it up straight with a side of crazy, Andrea Owen. Hey there, ass kickers. Welcome to the 110th episode of the podcast. I'm so excited, as always, to be here to present you with the guests that we have today talking about mothers, because who doesn't have some issues around that, right? So before I get to the guests, I wanted to tell you about a couple of things. One of the things that I'm really excited about, this might be a little bit premature that I'm talking to you about it. So we're in August right now when you're listening to this. And actually, it's not that premature because it's coming out in a month or so. I am going to start a recovery series. Very excited. So as most of you know, I am a person in long-term recovery from several addictions, one of them being alcohol. And I have been sober for nearly five years now. September 27th in 2016 will be my five-year sober anniversary. So when I have that anniversary, I'm going to kick off a separate part of the podcast. This podcast will not change. I will still have the regular episodes that I do. Some of them are solo episodes. Some of them are guests. But I am going to, in addition to that, put out some episodes that are just about recovery. I'm going to interview some of my friends and colleagues that are also women in recovery because I feel like it is such an important topic that I have so much to say about. And I know that not all of you can relate to it. So I didn't want to totally switch up the podcast, but I know that a lot of you can. And I still get emails asking for help around this. And so I just felt like this tugging in my heart that this was something that I needed to not just address. It's something that I need to really do something about. And so I hope that you join me for that. Of course, I will tell you more about it soon. So please stay tuned. And as long as you receive my updates via email, you will make sure not to miss it. That's probably the easiest way to get to know when that is coming out. So if you are not a subscriber, you can easily do that by texting the word kick ass, all one word, to the number 444-999. That's kick ass to 444-999. And you will get on that subscriber list and you will not miss when I am spreading the news about that recovery series. One other announcement that I have is that I just wanted to ask you if you want to come and hang out with me in person for a weekend and do some private one-on-one work. And I am opening up two spots for the rest of the year. So anytime in September, October, November, and December, I'm opening up two separate weekends for women to come and work with me privately. So it would be two nights. I'm going to put you up at a hotel out here in Greensboro, North Carolina. You would have to get your booty on a plane, or maybe if you're close enough, you could just drive and come out here. I will put you up in a hotel on a Friday afternoon slash evening and on an all day Saturday and a little bit of Sunday, you and I sit down and work together on the Daring Way program and Rising Strong program. If you don't know what that is, that is the private work that I do with women. I am certified in the work of Dr. Brene Brown, and that's the work that I do. It's deeply transformational, to put it lightly, and it's all about living your life from a place of courage. What you're going to walk away with, it gives you a tool set to deal with life's storms. Everything from like the small ones to the big ones and everything in between. And that's what I love so much about this. It's a complete tool set. I use the tools every single day in my life and I love teaching them. It's been the most transformational work I've ever done and I love teaching it. So you can come on over to my neck of the woods and hang out with me. We'll have dinner together. We'll laugh together. We will work on this together. You get workbooks and my book and presents from me and big hugs from me. And we will just kind of go head on and see what happens. And I will be with you every single step of the way. And then when you get home, we will also have a session via Skype together. 
So how to get more information on that? If you go to yourkickasslife.com forward slash coaching and you click on the button on the left hand side that says leadership coaching and mentoring, that'll give you more information about what the daring way and rising strong actually looks like. So if you're still interested after reading that and think it's something that resonates with you and is up your alley, then you can shoot us an email and all that information is on there. There's a quick questionnaire to fill out and then I will be in touch and we'll see if it's a good fit and we can give you the rest of the details. So really, this is something I wanted to do for so long and I just, I love in-person work. The retreats that I do where I get to actually like hug people in person and look in their eyes when they tell me their stories and I'm just honored to be able to do the work. It is transformational. It is hugely transformational. So if that is you and you've been kind of like itching to do it, it's also really great for people who don't want to do a six month commitment. Cause if we did this in increments, it takes six months. So we can knock it out in a weekend. All right. So I'm excited to hear from those of you who are interested in that. Let's move on to our interview today. Very excited for this conversation. Karen and I have known each other online for a while now, and I'm excited to have her speak to you about the specific work that she does in the world. But before I jump into the interview, let me tell you a little bit about Karen. <laughs> So she is an author and mentor who helps women who struggle with or are estranged from their mothers. She helps them overcome dysfunctional generational patterns and know that they can live truly happy, fulfilled lives no matter what. Karen does this because there's usually other stuff these women want to work on, but until they start to examine that very first and most important relationship, that other stuff often feels impossible. Karen is a master certified life coach through the Life Coach School. She is an emotional freedom techniques practitioner and the author of The Peaceful Daughter's Guide to Separating from a Difficult Mother. So without further ado, here is Karen. Ask Kickers, we are here and thank you so much for being here for another episode of the podcast. And I am joined by Karen Anderson. You already heard all about her in her super profesh bio. Here she is. Hi, Karen. Thanks for being here. Hey, Andrea. I am so, this has been like a long time coming, just us meeting forever. We've been friends online and a long time just having this conversation. And I'm so excited to talk to you about this specifically because I mentioned in one podcast episode a long time ago, I asked my guests like one question about our mothers and I was happy to talk about it because time after time after time, my one-on-one clients and the women in my classes and just in my community in general seem to have some issues with their mother, whether you have a very strange relationship with your mother or as a grown woman, there was some stuff that happened that you were feeling the need to process and work through. I'm stacked that you're here and let's jump right in. So what I'm really curious about and what I want to know is how did you come to do this work? Well, first I think is that I have a mother. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) And... I watched my mother have a very difficult relationship with her mother. Mm -hmm. And when I was younger in my, you know, teens and early twenties and mid twenties and maybe even early thirties, I thought that she and I had a great relationship and she would always say things like, I don't want to, you know, I want to have a better relationship with you than I have with my mother and, you know, that kind of thing. And in many ways we did have a good relationship. But what I didn't realize is that there was, I grew up in, um, you know, to say, uh, you know, every, I guess we all grew up in dysfunctional homes, but to some varying degree. Yes. Yeah. To varying degrees. And I think there was, what ended up happening is I met my husband, I moved away, you know, and I was in my early thirties. I wasn't, I was 35 when we got married and I finally started to see because I was in a very healthy relationship with my husband, just how unhealthy it was in the past. Oh, okay. And as I started to grow and change, and, you know, in my mind, I was becoming healthier and happier and better and like, you know, all the things more creative. I was enjoying my life. I had great relationship with my husband, which, you know, that wasn't modeled in my family. And the more I started to grow Mm -hmm. into a better, you know, to what I thought was a better person the more my mother and I didn't get along Mm. and the more, you know, she seemed to want to, you know, attack me a lot and it became very uncomfortable and very difficult and hurtful. And I found myself 
angry and bitter and, you know, just sort of trying then to resolve, you know, I was thinking about all the things that I grew up in. And to be honest, I kind of went into a victim consciousness at that sure. time. Yeah. I was full of blame. And so that's sort of the background. Um, you started to move forward from the blame. It sounds like that's when you kind of started to do your own work on yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, damn it. We can't change other people. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. And I saw myself playing out those patterns sometimes with my husband, sometimes with my stepkids, yeah. my sister who has a different mother, but you know, so it was funny. I often say that I kind of woke up in 2005 when I was trying to lose weight for yet the like millionth time. Mm -hmm. And I went to, I thought I was going to see somebody for hypnotherapy. And it turns out she knew how to do emotional freedom technique, which is mm -hmm. tapping. And it was at that point that I kind of like realized that I had the whole, you know, I hate myself <laughs> thing yeah. going on. And so, you know, starting at that point, I started to sort of unravel all that. And then I started blogging in 2009 and that actually in hindsight, kind of, it's the seemingly drove the wedge between my mother and I even further. She hated the fact that I was blogging. And it was through blogging that I started meeting life coaches. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I wrote a book. I wrote my first book and went to an event. I think it was a Christine Kane event. It's funny. I remember going to it and thinking I'll learn how to market my writing better. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying, just don't make me become a life coach. Yeah. Be careful what you wish for. And I came back and went to life coach school. Yeah. <laughs> it was doing that work that I really went deep mm -hmm. on this mother stuff. So you started to heal your own stuff and then got your training and certification and started to work with other women. But tell us what is the most common problem you see in adult daughters and their mothers? Let me phrase it this way. There's a concept, which I didn't make up, but it's called the mother wound. Uh -huh. And I don't really love that language, but it is what it is. And basically what happens is that so generation after generation after generation for hundreds and thousands of years, women who choose to be powerful, to self-express, to be themselves, you know, be autonomous, be, you know, powerful, as I said, that has always sort of ended badly for women. Mm -hmm. They were burned at the stake, basically. Yeah, literally, like, really bad. <laughs> yeah. And so there are two things at play. One is then that when a woman has a daughter, unconsciously, she fears for her daughter's mm -hmm. life, literally. That if my daughter is too big, too shiny, too whatever, too much, she is too awesome. much mm -hmm. she will be burned at the stake. Totally so I have to protect it. her at all costs. And again, this is unconscious. Mm -hmm. And then the second piece is that when, because we do evolve and with each generation, you know, we can, women are taking it to the next level, right? For ourselves. And so when the daughter does that, the mother thinks, damn, that's not fair. I wanted that. She becomes jealous. Mm. And then all of a sudden you're, you know, there's this anger, I guess the mother, you know, the mother's angry and jealous that she didn't get to have that freedom, that power, that, you know, shininess, whatever it was. And so she will then tend to criticize her daughter mm -hmm. and to hold her back. And I think the biggest, that's, so that's the biggest complaint I get is that, you know, something along the lines of my mother. I mean, it's not a lot of women believe that their mothers don't even love them, that they're so critical. They're constantly putting them down. And in some cases, I, you know, mental illness, addiction, sure. all of that plays mm -hmm. into it as well. You know, and again, to the degree that it happens, I think depends on, you know, any number of factors. So once you get to, you know, when someone starts working with you and, you uncover the problem, whatever it is, whether it's what you talked about or some kind of ancillary thing in their own life. Where do you even start when you help a woman with this topic? Well, you know, in coach world, we love to talk about thoughts and stories and beliefs. And I like to help a woman tell the story for once and for all. And 
you know, a lot of women who have this issue have usually been in therapy and have found that what they do is they just tell the story over and over and over again, and they become justified and almost rewarded for having the story. Mm -hmm. And that was my experience, you know, but it doesn't help them move forward. It just, I mean, in my own case, in my case, it was sort of like, oh, well, you know, it was funny. It was suggested to me that my mother might be a narcissist. And so it's like, oh, my mother's a narcissist. I guess I'm screwed. Now you know? you. Yeah. What do I yeah. do with that information? <laughs> and so the first thing we do is we go through the story and I have a very deliberate way of coaching them through telling their story, all the things that happened, all the things they wish had happened or wish hadn't happened, all the things their mother says, all the things their mother did and boil it down to, you know, basically What's the core message then that they have about themselves? Mm -hmm. What are they making all that mean about themselves? Yeah, exactly. And that becomes the sort of the kernel that we work with. And and I'm going to cut you off for a second. So like anyone listening who, you know, whether you are done with talk therapy or whether you've never done therapy, that's something that you can do. You can think about the story that you keep telling yourself, whether part of it is fabricated and exaggerated over the years, <laughs> whether it's 1000% true and it doesn't matter, but like, what are you, if it's floating around in your head, it's important because it's there. And what are you, I like people to write down, what are you making that mean about you? All right. Go yeah. on, Sanders. And you know, something that I used to get really hung up on is how do I talk about, and I get it now, how do, but how do I talk about the things that happened that could have been, that are important to know and to understand, like abuse, alcoholism, you know, things like that, that were happening. How do I tell that without being the victim Uh and taking it out of that whole sort of victim consciousness? Because that's, you know, that's all over the world. I mean, we see that in our families and we see it, you know, on a macro level everywhere playing out. But so how do we talk about, yeah, you could say that facts, you know, we don't know if it's a fact, but how do we talk about the facts of the situation in a way that doesn't create suffering? Sure. You know, so because, you know, a lot of times people say, oh, you're just saying that so that people will feel sorry for you. No, 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 no. That's not what we're doing here. You know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, what we make it mean and how we create suffering for ourselves or create freedom from the same story is basically what is the crux of what we do together. I like, yeah, I love that. And I like to tell people in my own life, I had a different situation. I didn't have that kind of relationship with my mother, but I definitely had a very dysfunctional relationship with a man that I was in a long relationship with. And for me, it was getting to the point where I had to take responsibility for what my role in it was. I want to differentiate that though with mothers and daughters, because when you're a child, you don't have any responsibility in dysfunctional (laughs) child mother relationship because you are a child. But when you become an adult, you you like to say a grown ass woman, (laughs) there comes a point when you need to take responsibility, I think, for what you're tolerating in the adult relationship with your mother and what you can get professional help for in your suffering and your struggle, Mm -hmm. because there are so many resources out there. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because for me, taking responsibility, that phrase, I used to hate that phrase. And because I, like we talk grown ass woman, And for me, the, my previous self was the woman child. That's kind of how I described myself. And, you know, I had a story, which was, I can't take care of myself. I'm irresponsible. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to manage money, Mm -hmm. you know, like that, those kinds of things, which were all more about actions. And so, you know, we're, you know, constantly being told you hear out there, you need to take responsibility for your actions for yourself, you know, like that kind of thing. And it wasn't until I learned that the first step to do that is that you take responsibility for your emotions Yes. that I was like, oh, and like, and then the rest fell into place. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great segue for something else I want to ask you, because you talk and teach a lot about emotional intelligence. So for the listeners, can you tell us what that actually is if someone's never heard that term before? And how does someone know if they need help in that area? Oh my gosh, that could be like a whole <laughs> whole three hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's, what's emotional um, intelligence? For me, emotional intelligence is simply the ability to identify, feel, and honor your emotions, yep. whether it's, you know, joy and 
contentment and peace, Mm -hmm. or if it's, you know, anger, shame, and disgust, (laughs) you know, the key to all of that is understanding that you're creating all of your emotions. Mm -hmm. And that's where the real power comes from. And that's what I call the woohoo moment, (laughs) right? It's where you're like, woohoo, I'm so powerful. Look at me creating my emotions here. Oh, you mean I've been giving them away this whole time and now I have to continue to do this? And so thought, what kind of person, for someone who's listening and they're still not sure if they might struggle in that area, so how would someone kind of identify if they might need to look into emotional intelligence and get help there? Well, if, especially in regards to your mother, it would be you saying things like, God, my mother pisses me off. God, you know, I have no choice. I'm going to have to just cut her out of my life. She's, you know, she pisses me off. She can't believe she said that. Mm -hmm. My life is a wreck because she is a narcissist or, you know, whatever she is. Yeah. Yeah. That's how you know is when you're saying things like that. So probably most everyone. (laughs) (laughs) And also, and also you can, the key is you notice yourself saying that. And you also then forgive yourself and say, yeah, gosh, I'm a human being. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right? It's not I, to beat yourself up over because you say something like that. Right. Every time I find myself saying that about someone, I know that for me, I either need to set a boundary and or own some stuff mm-hmm. and or have a hard conversation with someone that mm-hmm. I don't want to have that I usually put off for a few months. <laughs> For a few years? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever put it off for years. The old me, but the new me, it's like doing this work. Like I have such, I feel so like such like a hypocrite when I'm putting off conversations. And plus I always talk to my, I mean, it's kind of a hazard having life coaches as friends, <laughs> as friends, because then they like call me out. Something happened. Actually, it was this week where I wanted to deal with something in a certain way. And I just, I wanted to be right about it. Like I wanted to do this certain thing and I ran it by my best friend, Amy. And Amy called me out on it and was like, that's really not an integrity. And you should probably have this conversation with this person. I was like, no, I'm just going to do it my way. So then I went to my friend, Kate, and was like, here's what I want you to tell me. (laughs) Yeah. And she said, she was like, I'm kind of with Amy on this one. And I was like, no, you guys are assholes. So I ended up doing the right. My person like that is somebody that you know, Christy Inge. I I do know Christy Inge. She's great. (laughs) Yeah, it is a hazard. I'm glad that I did it. I'm glad that I took the time and wrote this person an email. And I was proud of how I showed up, even though I didn't want to. I think that emotional intelligence, I think for me, and what I like to say on this podcast, I've said it several times because I think that people need to hear it, maybe from a place of validation. Not many of us grew up in homes where emotional intelligence was modeled. Our parents' generation did not have those tools. Mm -hmm. And so I never want to say that from a place of blaming and shaming our parents because they just didn't know any better. Their models, you know, like pretty much like you parented from a place of fear and shame. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that's how you motivated behavior changes. And I know for a lot of them, there was a lot of love, but people didn't know how to... There was just the mentality that emotions don't solve problems, so we don't need to show them in this family. Mm-hmm. That was very common. And so I think that for a lot of us growing up, we kind of, you know, we grow up and we realize that we want to parent differently and we don't know what that looks like. So that's where you need to learn. And that's why I love Brene's work. And even I found Rising Strong very helpful in mm-hmm. learning how to navigate feelings and get really curious about them. And that way we can teach that to the next generation and have it right. in our friendships and our adult relationships. Yeah, totally. Yeah, because you bring up a point about modeling, which, you know, a lot of times for some women, it is, as I said, there's abuse or addiction or, you know, that kind of thing going on in a family. So things happen to the child, to, you know, to us as little children. Mm-hmm. But then what's modeled is even more powerful. So even if you weren't, You know, if you weren't abused, right, or they weren't drinking, but they were not in touch with their emotions, they had no emotional intelligence or, you know, didn't know how to just allow, you know, someone to cry. That can have, you know, just as much an effect on us as the outright, as I said, abuse or 
serious dysfunction. Mm -hmm. I read, I might've been even in Rising Strong that there's a name for that and it's called emotional neglect. And Mm. it's not any kind of, I don't know. I still have a hard time wrapping my brain around that it, that it's a form of abuse, but it is like I was mentioning, it's like when you were made to feel wrong for your emotions, when you Mm -hmm. were basically told, you know, your feelings don't matter and, you know, or go do that in your room, come out when you put a smile on your face or stop crying or I'll give you something to cry about. Like those types of things that many of us were commonly told that is a form of emotional neglect and we didn't know any better. And so I want to quickly kind of shift gears around boundaries. And so mm-hmm. you help women set boundaries. We can talk a little bit about boundaries and like what they actually are, but I want to, maybe I'm jumping ahead a little bit. So feel free to kind of shoot from the hip and just talk, you know, the floor is yours about boundaries. But here's what I hear a lot from women is that they will muster up the courage to set a boundary with their mother and they feel debilitating guilt. Mm -hmm. So what do you advise for those types of situations? Stop it. No. (laughs) Um, Just stop feeling that way. (laughs) Well, first of all, I love to coach a woman through actually feeling the guilt. Mm -hmm. Right. Let's okay. You feel guilty. Let's feel the guilt. Right. And like get them in their body, get them to, you know, be able to describe the way the guilt feels, where it is in their body, you know, get really familiar and, comfortable even with guilt because the more you dive into an emotion the more you are able to literally feel the sensations of it and know oh there's guilt there's guilt inside my body right now then it kind of like starts to take it down a notch or two and from there you can then start to ask yourself well what is this guilt really trying to tell me and something that I love to say is that emotions, and when I say emotion in this case, I'm talking about that literal sensation that you feel in your body. Like, you know how we talk about like making what we're making things mean? Mm -hmm. We have a tendency to make our emotions mean something, that they're proof of something. Yes. And so if I feel guilt, then that must be proof that I should feel guilt. Mm Mm-hmm. And I find that that distinction, when you start to like really think about it that way, kind of, as I said, helps take it down a notch. And you can ask yourself, you know, is it true that I should be feeling guilt? Mm -hmm. And if so, why? We can go around and around and around, you know, coaching thoughts, but sometimes coaching the emotion in that way, like asking, you know, what does this emotion, what are you making this emotion mean about you, about the situation Mm -hmm. can help sort of you know, without trying to go into change the thought, it just sort of kind of dissipates naturally. Yeah. I love that. And I'm going to post in our resources. So in the show notes, everyone knows the, all the links to, you know, Karen stuff is here. And I'm going to post a former podcast episode that I did. That was an entire episode on how to have hard conversations. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think I can speak for Karen and say that we don't advise anyone to just like jump into a conversation with their mother or anyone else and set a boundary without thoroughly thinking about it and getting clear <laughs> about right, it. And do you want to try speaking on that for a moment about, you know, kind of like the logistics, if you will, of setting a boundary with one's mother. So in my book, I actually have a whole thing about, you know, tips or whatever, like how to get yourself ready to set the boundary. And I think understanding that when you, you know, what you just said, you don't want to just jump into it, especially if you're angry, but from a, you know, like I call it from a clean place, which is where you're taking responsibility and you're saying, I'm setting this boundary for me because I'm learning how to take responsibility for me. This isn't about changing her. Mm -hmm. Right. Because that's what we really want. Like, wouldn't that be exactly. great if you could just change them as a human? <laughs> well, yeah. Yes and no. Like, my own experience has shown me that I used to feel that way. Like, if she would just change, then I could be happy. Mm-hmm. And what I have found is that there is immense, much more happiness, if you will, or peace, contentment for me in letting her be exactly who she is. And when I say let, I don't mean that from a, you know, when I love her exact, you know, exactly the way she is, I feel so much better than if I had changed her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So the logistics for me of setting a boundary, once you're in a clean place and ready, you know, as clean as possible place to set the boundary is really simple. 
And the first step is that you make a request and the request, you know, we'll use a really simple example. Please don't smoke in my car. Mm -hmm. And then the second part of the boundary is the consequence. And the consequence is always something that you will do. It's always on you. Mm -hmm. Please don't smoke in my car. If you'd like to smoke, I'll pull over so that you can get out and smoke. So you're making a compromise, kind of, in a way. Mm -hmm. In that case, yeah. Yeah. Uh, You know, or please don't yell at me on the phone. If you continue to yell, I'll hang up. Sometimes having a difficult conversation with somebody, you know, some, it brings up your stuff. And I don't think there is anything wrong with not making the request out loud. So, for example, you know that your boundary is that you don't want to be yelled at on the phone. And if somebody yells at you on the phone, you're going to hang up. Mm-hmm. That you just do that the minute they start yelling. So you have to actually follow through. Exactly. That's the hard <laughs> <laughs> and the other the other thing is is because this is something I hear all the time, but she's not respecting my boundary. And I say she doesn't have to. Right. You know, you do. <laughs> yeah. It's like damn. <laughs> when I talk about boundaries, I always mention that. That it's sometimes it's not even the setting of the boundary that's hard. It's the following through with it that's the yeah. hardest. Because yeah. most likely if you're having to set a boundary with someone, they are going to try to call your bluff and cross it. So you have to be prepared for that. Like, yeah. what are you actually going to do? It's kind of like parenting. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Which I've it. never done. <laughs> a lot like parenting. So, right, let's kind of switch over and jump into the deep end a little bit here and talk about shame. And I know that you work a lot with this with women in varying degrees. Maybe a lot of the shame that they have is stemmed from the relationship with, that they have with their mother, or you know, it could come from a multitude of different ways. And so, what do you? I mean, we can kind of start anywhere. I mean, I love to talk about shame. I know <laughs> my people know if they listen to one of my podcast episodes, I yell the word out at inappropriate times. <laughs> Woohoo! Shame! Yes, yes. My shame! <laughs> so, where does it show up most typically in your work? As you said earlier, our parents and their parents, you know, I think shaming was a parenting technique. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. And so that's where it comes from. And, you know, again, I think that, I mean, we get get into a whole thing about the patriarchy, but... The patriarchy! Right, no, I definitely (laughs) think that that is a, it's a masculine, this isn't man bashing at all. But that it's that masculine energy. Yep. It's, yeah, it's laying down the hammer. Exactly. And, you know, I mean, you're certified with Brene, right? And so, you know, you know, she, I mean, she's like the queen of shame. How do you like to be the queen of shame? She's not, she's the, like, she's really, like, she's my go-to on that. Mm-hmm. And, but so anyway, for how, you know, it shows up in women is adult, you know, daughters with mothers that they're struggling with is shame around the fact that they haven't been able to fix the relationship, shame that they feel in themselves about themselves. And it shows up around weight and any number of the typical things that women struggle with. Body and appearance. Number one shame. Exactly. Money, Mm -hmm. relationships with men. And it all, you know, it's this core, I'm not good enough. Sexuality, yes. So (laughs) like, and it's funny because, and I don't know if this is true, but I like to say it because it makes sense to me. And that is, I don't think there's anybody on earth who doesn't have the "I'm not good enough" story from time to time. I would agree with that. I think even Miss Jagger, Mick Jagger has it Mm -hmm. sometimes, and Oprah, and you know everybody. And the difference is. That they know that it's just a thought floating through their head. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, those of us who have struggled with it a little bit more, believe it. (laughs) Live live in it. It's like there's a code. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that what I like to just point out quickly is that I have had some people in my circles and listeners say, I don't really resonate when you say, like, I don't feel worthy or, you know, that whole concept. And so another way of putting that is that you don't matter. You know, you aren't good enough and that you don't matter. So those are same feeling. Right. For whatever, you know, whatever language resonates with you, yeah. it's that's, yeah. Also into the same category is the concept that no one really cares about you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The word that I've used for myself often, <laughs> even recently sometimes, is pathetic. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is a fun conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Pathetic no, I don't mean to, I don't mean to, I don't mean to make light of it, but it's no, but it's it's serious, but it's so common and universal. And I think that what I wanted to just jump in and say is, and I'm glad that you said that. Like, though, with this, just I just thought this last week, and we all still have it. The difference is, is that we gain tools and knowledge and wisdom to be able to work through it when it shows up in our life. That's really yeah. the only difference. It is. I mean, you know, I have a client right now who is, I just want this to be over. I never want to think this again, you know, and I'm like, sorry, I can't make that. That's not going to happen. I mean, maybe it could happen. I don't know. But I know for me, there's a lot more relief in understanding that it's normal for my brain to go there sometimes. Absolutely. You know what? I can relate to your client. I've said that. Me too. About certain big things in my life. And I have found out the more I resist and the more I get angry at myself for feeling a certain way or not being over it or, Mm -hmm. you know, I shouldn't feel this way anymore. Don't I know better than this? That to me is like almost like trying to bully myself (laughs) into being better. And like, I talk about that all the time. It doesn't work. So the more I surrender to what is and the feelings, whatever they are, regret, grief, loss, resentment, frustration, any of like the harder emotions, the more I just surrender into them and let them come in. Mm -hmm. They're usually only around for a day, maybe a couple at the most, depending on the situation. And then it's like meditation, like the clouds coming in and going out and then they're gone. And I can't believe it took me so long to understand that. You know, it's like I was under the impression in the beginning of my personal development journey that if I was strong enough and that I was badass enough and if I kicked enough ass, I would be able to manage my inner critic. I would be able to tackle shame to the ground and, you know, put some shackles on it. I'd be able to just like get over it and get my shit together. Like that was all of that. And then I quickly, quickly, Karen, (laughs) got like sidelined. That was not the case at all. Yeah. And so then like, you know, yeah, we, I was sitting here with like a big smile on my face and here we are talking about being pathetic and all that. And because in the moment it feels like Mm -hmm. but I know enough now to know that it isn't forever and that it's, as I said, normal. And I guess maybe there's some argument as to whether or not you can feel two emotions at the same exact time. I believe you can. But I strive for when I am feeling my most pathetic to be like, to have just a tiny bit of compassion at the same time. Like, oh, there you are feeling pathetic. It's okay. (laughs) And that gets to something that is big for me and my clients is learning how to self mother. Yes. So say more about that. Because if we didn't really have the model, right? We didn't, you know, there's a lot that probably every woman and maybe every man too could say, you know, I really wish I'd gotten more of this from my mom, right? Whatever it is. And you can really learn to give it to yourself. And, you know, I think sometimes a lot of us think of it in terms of being strict and judgmental and that that's what mothering yourself is. And it's not. And it's also not like, you know, we often hear about self-care, And that being pedicures and bubble baths and it's not, you know, it's, um, I mean, it can be that too, but it's in that moment when you're feeling shame Mm -hmm. that you are able to, as I like to say, take yourself onto your own lap. Mm -hmm. Self-compassion. Yeah. Yeah. Treating yourself like you would someone you care about and knowing that your problems are the same as everyone else's. Yep. That's what self-compassion is. And And I want to add to that too is, and this is a tough one because this is not the case for everyone. I never want to make anyone feel worse when they walk away from these podcast episodes, but I think it's so important for me to talk about because it is something that can be created in one's life with attention is that of a compassionate witness and having that person. And what Brene says is having someone who's earned the right to hear your story yeah. And as you know, having, you know, been well versed in Brene's work, that the antidote for shame is empathy and sharing those feelings of feeling pathetic and getting it wrong and failing and being angry or whatever the feelings are in front of someone else. Mm-hmm. And who that, deserves to be there. Right. And that your story, sharing with them that your relationship can bear the weight of it. And mm-hmm. that's so hard for so many people because people tell me, 
they get to be our age and a lot of times they don't have those friendships. And, and I get it. It's hard to trust someone when you've been around the block as we have, <laughs> there's, you have been betrayed. <laughs> I can almost guarantee you have opened up to someone and they have hurt you, whether it's in an intimate relationship or a friendship or your mother or a sibling or whomever. And it's hard to open that door again. And you know, this, it gets to the, it's funny. How do you trust somebody? Right. I mean, I think that's hard for a lot of people. I mean, I'll never trust again, especially in a romantic relationship. Right. Right. And this is where you have to learn really the only person you have to trust is yourself. yourself. Mm -hmm. And so it gets to the point where you trust yourself enough that you have your own back. And yes, and at the same time, you will, in that process, find the people who deserve to hear your story Mm -hmm. and to be with you. Yeah. I wish I could say, because I don't know exactly how it happened, that... I don't know how I attracted my husband into my life because he is that person for me. Mm. And I do have some very good friends too. But, you know, when I met him, I was asleep at the freaking wheel, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? So was it luck? I don't know. But yeah, I'm very, very grateful for that. I think, yes, like trusting yourself first is important. And research shows us that trust is built in small increments over time. And And I think that what a misconception is, is that we share all like, you know, and I've done this many times and Brene calls it a vulnerability hangover. It's like, we're trying to hotwire our connection with someone. It's like we meet and then we tell them our deepest, darkest secrets because this is what we think is good. You know, it's like, I'm just going to get it all out right away. If they're worthy of being my compassionate witness friend, then that's great. Let's just see. And that's really not how trust is organically and naturally built. And then people walk away from these conversations feeling like total Mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, for those people that are listening, like if you have those people in your life that are possibilities that you trust even a little bit, I encourage you to start just sharing a little bit more, you know, and just kind of testing the waters and seeing what happens. And even, you know, I encourage people to like share how uncomfortable it makes them like preface the conversation and say like, this makes me really uncomfortable to share with you, but I'm trying to be more open in my friendships and I really think you're a great friend. So this happened and, you know, kind of just hold your breath and see what happens. And Mm -hmm. what I'm saying is that you have to be proactive about it. And I think you can develop self-trust in the same way. And that's in small incremental. It's like you keep your promise to yourself with a very small thing. Mm -hmm. And then you show yourself that you're keeping your promise to yourself And you learn to trust yourself. Yeah. And so you can do that with very small little things like, I'm going to get up and pee when I have to pee. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Yeah. I like that. I thought you were going to say like, listen to my intuition when it comes up, but that's actually a big one. (laughs) But like, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Your body, you know, it's funny. Intuition is such an interesting thing. And I think it really is just a matter of, of the sensations that we feel in our body and really like having to pee. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Yes. Oh my, I love this conversation. Okay. So we need to wrap it up, but I have one more question for you that I ask all of my guests and take your time with it. And that question is what surprises you about the work you do with women? A lot of things. I think how universal it is surprises me sometimes. And then at the same time, it doesn't. Also that... It's a journey that we're going on together. It's not like I have all the answers Mm -hmm. (laughs) and I get as much out of it as hopefully they get. Yeah, I would agree with that. That has been surprising. And I guess in a way it's surprising to me that I even get to do it. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, well, this work is so necessary in the world. Mother-daughter relationships healing, shame, boundaries, emotional intelligence. And I'm just, I'm grateful for you. And I'm grateful for this conversation. Thank you so much. Well, do all of that. So for any of you listening, you can head on over to the show notes and grab all of Karen's links and a couple of the other links that I mentioned here, as well as a link to Karen's book. And but Karen, if someone's online right now, what's the easiest way for them to find out information about you? Where should they go? K C L Anderson 
kclanderson.com. kclanderson.com. Thank you so much for being here. And ass kickers, thank you for hanging in there with us on this new episode of the Your Kick-Ass Life podcast. And I will see you all out in cyberspace. Bye-bye.